Acts chapter number 27. <clears throat> Going to read a few verses today. Now in this chapter we find the Apostle Paul giving his testimony. It's not a trial because Paul had already appealed unto Caesar. King Agrippa could not put Paul on trial, but he said, you know what, I want to hear about this whole situation. He said, I find this very interesting. Festus brought it up to him. So one day, Agrippa and all his court sit down, and they say, Paul, what you got to say? And as the Apostle Paul starts, I mean, we've taught on Sunday school, out of verse number two, I think myself happy. A lot of people think themselves depressed, but the Apostle Paul thought himself happy that day. And I don't think just that day. I think every day the Apostle Paul thought himself happy. But he starts testifying about who he used to be, Saul of Tarsus. And then, verse number 12, where we're going to begin reading, this is his account of his trip down the Damascus road one day. He says, Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and then them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Is it hard for thee to kick against the pricks? And I said, Where art thou, Lord? And he's, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in, in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering from thee, from the people, and from the Gentiles, of, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes, and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins, and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me." Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of, da of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. For these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Now that's not the end of his testimony. This isn't the only testimony the Apostle Paul gives several times they put him on trial. But right before this, Festus wanted to hear the, the account of why the Apostle Paul found himself in bonds. And every time they all came to the same conclusion, this guy hadn't done anything worthy of death. Well, what was the conclusion that Pilate said to Jesus? I find no fault in him. Right before the purposes of God, the Apostle Paul found himself here. And later on, verse number 28... Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Now almost, I don't know if that meant that God was working on him and God could have worked on him for the rest of his life. He could have repented at some point. But that day, what he's saying is, Paul, you make a pretty good case on why everyone should be a Christian. I mean, the Apostle Paul in the verse said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am except these bonds. He's saying, except for me being captive and you being free, I wish you were just like me. What caused the Apostle Paul to declare that? What caused him to say, I don't wish that, you know, God bless you with great health and riches. I don't know. He didn't say, well, King Agrippa, I pray that, you know, God will bless you because you're king and you've got rule over other people. I pray that he'll give you wisdom like he did Solomon. No. He just says, I pray all together. You're just like me. But do you understand what that means? Yeah. In verse number 11, the Apostle Paul talking about what he did to those that professed the name of Jesus Christ before he got saved. He said, And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. That was the mindset of everybody of that day except for those that had met Jesus Christ. They would punish those that professed Jesus. They would scourge them. And the Apostle Paul says, I caused them to lie against God. That's what blaspheme means. He said, I tortured them until they denied the name of Christ. 
and knowing that that's the treatment that many would give King Agrippa if he were to become a Christian. Agrippa knew that. He knew everything that would happen to him. He knew how the Jews tried to kill Paul. And still knowing that, he said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Agrippa knew the prophets. I mean, verse number 26, Saul said, For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Agrippa was educated. He knew the forerunners of Christ through the prophets. He had heard about John the Baptist, that one crying out in the wilderness like a wild man, saying, prepare the way of the Lord. He had heard all of these things, but he didn't just hear them. He believed them. And the Apostle Paul says, you believe the prophets, but he's saying you didn't believe the very Son of God. But he's saying, I wish that you, except for these bonds, were just like me. He's saying, I wish that you would reject everything you've ever been taught. Because he was taught the law. That he could find favor with God through the law. No, we could find a space of grace through the law until God made the perfect way through his son. He's saying, I wish that you would recant everything that you've ever said spiritually. He's saying, Agrippa, all those times that you told people that through works people could obtain God's favor, that sacrifice was what made them holy, and saying, I wish that you would reject all of it, recant all of it, and realize that you were a liar. The Apostle Paul said, I used to persecute them, but he says, now I'm one of them. When he said that I caused the followers of Christ to blaspheme, everybody in attendance that day that was a Pharisee, or that was a religious leader at the time, he's calling them a liar. He says, I caused those that were truthful to lie so that the liars could continue to look like they were telling the truth. And he's standing there with authority and unction from God, preaching up a storm. Festus said, you talk like a madman. Much learning doesn't make thee mad. He said, hey, I'm not crazy. I just saw Jesus. But the Apostle Paul's trying to convince, doing his best to just say, I wish that you didn't just dabble in it. I wish that you didn't just consider it. I wish you just got in. I wish you was like me. Not in bonds, but receiving the freedom through the Son. That if he sets you free, you're free indeed. He's saying, Agrippa, you don't understand. You're in bondage right now. And although in my flesh I'm in bonds, I'm a free man. He just said in the verse that we read, in verse number 26, that I speak freely before the king. Why was he speaking freely? Because they loosed him and let him go? No. Because he stood in the liberty where Christ makes free. He was speaking freely about the one that set him free, which he wasn't allowed to do everywhere. Go and read in... You know, some of the epistles on the accounts of how many times he was stoned. How many times he had been scourged. You know why? Because they wouldn't let him talk freely in those cities. But here he found an audience with some royalty. And they said, no. Go ahead and talk. We want to hear about this. But we're not going to teach on any of that. But to set the stage, you had to understand that. Paul's whole testimony can be boiled down to one phrase. What doesn't do much good if you just walked in and said this. He had to do it a little bit of elaborating. But everything from where he starts, he's saying, if you knew how I was raised, if you knew who I was, if you knew everything that I know, but more importantly, in verse number 13, at midday, O king, I saw the light from heaven. He was saying, one day I had a day where I learned something new that I'd never seen before. I'd never heard before. And because of that one day, everything changed. So what the Lord said, we're going to teach on this morning, if you'd seen what I've seen. Amen. He says, Agrippa, if you'd seen what I'd seen, you'd be just like me, except for these bonds. He was saying, if everybody in here was on that road, on the, the road to Damascus that day, they would have seen it. And I mean, in fact, when the Hebrews put him on trial, he said, hey, go round up the dudes that were on the road with me that day. 
They didn't hear the voice from heaven, but they saw the light and they fell down as dead men on the ground. He said, go ask them what happened. He said, I saw something that was so miraculous, so out of the ordinary, so unusual that no man could deny it. And he said, because of what I saw, I'm changed and I'm a new man today. Well, we got some unusual things happening around here. And unusual would be a good thing. Usual is not doing it. But, this isn't the first time that things have got a little high around here. If you'd seen what I've seen, you'd know that God's done a work around this place. Not just in the past couple of weeks, but about, oh, two decades. I mean, Brother Clint was here. I don't know if anybody else is there. I remember in the old building, Brother Clint, when we didn't have Sunday school because there hadn't been kids in so many years. I remember when congregational singing was either done without a piano or it was done with Brother Clint strumming a guitar. And that's all the music that we ever got. I remember when instead of a sound system, there were these little like brown boxes on the wall that had like four speakers stacked in them and half of them didn't work. And the sound system could or could not play a tape track depending on which day it was. Right? I remember the old sound room, Brother Randy, that you sat in. That was just a little cabinet with two doors on it. And you had to unpack it and then pack it back up every day. Right? I remember when the day the pastor took the church, a third of them left before the next service. Right? I remember when the parking lot was gravel and we were thankful for that. Because if it wasn't for the gravel, you know, it had been a mud, slick road up this hill a couple of times. It had been a struggle getting here. Right? I remember when some people just got a hold of what God was doing around here and God started sending them. And then before you know it, them saloon-style doors we had in the old building that would take you into the sanctuary, we had to prop them things open every service and we had folding chairs out in between where the Sunday school room and the nursery and the bathrooms were because we couldn't fit everybody into the sanctuary. I've seen the services in the old building where God got so thick in there that people would be in the altar for 45 minutes or an hour. I've seen where it was uncomfortable because the old orange pews were broken down and had been there for forever, but people didn't care. Right? I remember the old organ that some days it worked, some days it didn't because it had a few shorts in some of the keys. But it didn't matter because people weren't listening to the organ. They were thinking about the one that they were singing about. I remember when in order to get to the baptistry you either had to go through the treasury or you had to go through the pastor's office. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that when we had a baptismal service the pastor had to throw sheets and you know towels over all of his books in his office because somebody coming down them steps in there could you know ruin a couple of books. Right? I remember those days. But I also remember services where the pastor got in such a big way of preaching, he went from the pulpit out the brown doors and started preaching in a field over here. Brother Randy had a heart attack. He had to turn the mic on because the old building is so small you never had to turn the sound on because the preacher preached so loud. But then all of a sudden we couldn't hear him because the door shut behind him. And you want to know how I know God was in it? Those doors were never unlocked, but when he came back to pull on that door handle, the door just came open. Those doors were always locked back in the old days. I've seen services in that building that changed people that they still hold on to to this day. I still remember the revival that Brother Bobby and Brother Luther Spivey came up and preached for us. Not because that was the time that Mom decided to get him back and have a police officer show up and intimidate him. Right? Not because of that. I remember one service, both of them preached. Can you imagine two preachers preaching in the same service a full message? How many people nowadays in this building would complain? Well, that was a long service. But I remember Brother Luther preached first. God's all over Brother Luther. Brother Bobby, he's sitting in the pew. I saw him jotting some stuff. I was like, What's, he's taking some real good notes. No, no, no. God gave him a bit. He said, I've never done this before. He had one of the little white prayer slips, write the prayer request on, that used to go in the baskets. And God gave him three... He preached out of the same text and just kept the message going. That was also the meeting that you preached that road to Emmaus where he broke the bread and the plate and they didn't realize until they saw the nail scars 
That oh, that was Jesus. I remember meetings, other places, camp meetings. I'll never forget that message that uh, Brother Travis Pivey preached on the mantle. Where he, he, God got all over that. He started taking great men of God's jackets and saying, who wants the man of God's mantle? And he got to Brother Luther's and he, he said, you guys can't have this one, this one's mine. I remember that message Brother Tony Finney preached on the anchor. Tied that anchor around himself, dropped it in the choir loft, said he could only get he get about two steps off of the platform, and then God pulled him back. I remember. But I've seen God show up big, but I said all that to say this. I've never seen him show up so often and so big as he has around here lately. I'm not the most spiritual. I'm not somebody that goes around and hey, but I know when God shows up. And I also know it's unusual for him to show up as much as he has, as often as he has. So if you'd seen what I've seen, you'd be excited. But you'd also be nervous. If you'd seen what I've seen, you'd know that anything, one bad testimony that's not in the will of God, one song or even one shout, that isn't in the will of God. One moment where you let your mind wander could be the thing that kills the service. Sometimes God's gracious and merciful. Somebody will do that and it'll grieve the Holy Ghost or it'll quench it, but he'll start it back up again. But there's no promise of that. If you've seen what I've seen, you'd have seen the services where it was building and all of a sudden it deflated and then by the end of it, the preacher's just struggling to even get out the thought that God put on his heart because he's fighting against whatever was in the crowd that night because somebody stubbed up on God. But if you'd seen what I've seen, you'd know that God wants to do something. But you'd also know that God's able to do something. I'm talking in this church. I've seen no less that I know of three individuals young ladies that with a broken heart stood up humble before the church and humble before God said I can't have a child but if it be the will of God I pray that he touch me to where I could have a child like Hannah they went in and they got the horns of the altar they got other people to get a burden for them and then now they got more kids running around than I count two of them in South Carolina because one of them was one of Brother Greg's daughters. It's one thing to read about Hannah. It's another thing to see it happen. I've seen those that said, doctor says there's no hope. Some of them humble themselves and say, I read where the Bible says, let the elders of the church anoint you with oil, pray for you. And I've seen it happen around here. I've seen the hand of God move where if you looked at the MRIs, there shouldn't be any way that he'd be able to walk, let alone to get up here and to hop around and to squall and do everything else that he does every Sunday. But it's still like that. He's never had surgery, never had physical therapy. But because some people got a burden and started praying, God touched him, and God's never stopped touching him. I've seen those that had cancer never miss a service. Not because they're super spiritual, but this because they had faith that God would give them the strength to go to the place and worship the one that they love. I've seen those in situations where there was no hope, God walk in and give all the hope. Because y'all may not understand it. I don't get... My, some people come up and ask me all the time, and it's one of my pet peeves, hey, what's your dad think about this? I don't know. We don't share a brain. You want to know? Go ask him. I don't know. Tammy does it to me all the time back in the office. She's like, what's your dad want to do with this? I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. Why don't we ask him? Right? But even though we don't share a brain, I have lived with him for all my life. I have gotten half of some of the phone call conversations that he's had over the years. I have seen people show up and just take care of business 
either between them and God or between them and the preacher, say, hey, God told me to do this. I've heard stories that he's told around the dinner table that other people may not get to hear. And I've seen all the people that were broken, hurt by church members, hurt by other preachers, hurt by pharisaical doctrines, hurt by liberal doctrines, hurt by false doctrines. And they come because they heard that there's a place that God really does meet with his people. And he'll, God will just take that balm of Gilead and apply it to their life. And what was broken, God will mend it again. What used to look like a dead tree, all of a sudden has got fruit all over it again. And I've seen the way that God will just put his finger on somebody's life and use people like those up there on that trophies of God's grace. There's a reason that their names are around the church house to this day. Not because they were super spiritual, just because they loved God and allowed God to use them. Just because they were willing to say, I'll make up the hedge and stand in the gap. If you've seen what I've seen, you've, there's no telling what God can do with just a handful. But there's no telling the miracles that God will do in the midst. Because here's the thing, if God didn't want to do it, the doors out there wouldn't be open. If God didn't want to do it, He wouldn't be sitting in on the services and manifesting His presence among us. If God didn't want to do it, He'd have closed up shop and no man could do it. Because if God closes the door, no man can open it. And if man you know, tries to close the door that God's open, it can't be shut. But some people just say, Lord, if, if you would just show me grace and mercy and make it happen, I'll do it. And then most of the time, God ends up giving it to him, pressed down, shaking, bubbling over. And they're the ones that no matter what's going on in the service, they're plugged in. Because it's not about the people. It's about Him. It's not about having a good service. Whether it's a good service to anybody else, they're going to have themselves a time. Amen. You know who I think of? Brother Bobby Bowling. Crippled. His entire, in pain. His every second of every day. He preached a revival in the old building. If he's in the service, you knew it. Because every chance he got, he was shouting out at the top of his lungs. And you know why he, he said he'd do it? Because he wanted to let the devil know that he couldn't be defeated by pain. And he wanted to let God know that he was appreciative that God did for him what he did. God called him, he preached a revival. We pulled up this communion table, pulled it out from the pulpit, put a chair behind it, and he'd get to rocking back in that folding chair that we had. I thought this pulpit was going to tip backwards. He could. But you want to know why he had a touch? Because he got a burden and he just wanted to praise God the best he could. That's right. I've seen God touch people and do miracles. I've seen God touch people and give them a burden. And God used that burden to turn their life upside down and do a great work for the things of God. But if you'd seen what I've saw, you know that those burdens don't come without much prayer, without much supplication. Sometimes with much fasting. I did some math the other day. I haven't turned on my PlayStation in a long time. But I turned it on yesterday. Just to look. Pulled up one of the old Call of Duty. The last Call of Duty game that I actually played for a full year. But Brian, 27 days worth of time. Sounds like a lot, but that's two hours a day. Two hours a day on average will give you a month of the year. What if we gave two hours a day to God and a, a whole month of the year was just us spending time with God? We don't know why men like Spurgeon, men like Finney, men like Billy Sunday had a touch of God. Because by candlelight or by early dawn light, they'd spend all day fellowshipping with God. They took it so serious that they literally lived by faith. They didn't know where they'd stay that night. They didn't know what God would give them to eat that day, but they knew that they were going to spend the day fellowshipping with God and telling other people about God. Want to know why revival used to happen? Because people would forsake all and just embrace Jesus. I've never seen that, but I've seen some that forsake all and just get a hold of Jesus, and God used them to do a great work. Want an example? Brother Rocky Shelton. 
somebody that the world would say, he can't do anything. That one man, just because he's obedient, he'll tell you that it's not because of him. He'll tell you that he couldn't have made anything happen that's happened, let alone one of the things happen. And you see how God, why? Because one man was obedient. And he took the labor for the Lord as a labor of love. And even falling off a ladder and breaking his ankle can't stop him. He's probably still preaching. I'd be surprised if he missed a service over there at the mission. Why do say? Because he just loves God that much. If you've seen what I've seen, you know that God can do it. But we got to get plugged in. If you've seen what I've seen, you'd know the burden that God has for lost souls. I've done a lot of teaching in the Sunday school class on Islam, on other false religions. On We did one on demonic activity in the world. If you've seen all the faces that I see every day at work come in the door, some professing to be Christians, some not, and you see the hopelessness on their faces, not because they're in pain, but because they don't see a point in each and every day. I've talked to people and they say, I just, I just don't know what I'm going to do because of this corona. I feel sorry for them. Really, I'm heartbroken for them. Because I know what I'm going to do. Lord willing, by the grace of God, you take everything away from me, I'll still be here on Sunday. I'll still be here on Wednesday. Why? Because my life is not based on things, it's based on Him. I do not value you know the success or the failure of my life based off of what I have or what I've done I base it off of what he's done if you've seen what I've seen not three years after we graduated high school one of the guys that I played football with for three years five days a week spent with him well sometimes six because we had films on Saturday morning Five days a week, talk with them, cut up with them. We pick on each other, we rib each other. Now, three years later, he's dead of a heroin overdose. Had a good job. He was a welder. He went through the technical school program at Boone. He took welding classes for three and a half years. He got a job right out of high school making $30 an hour. He's doing good. Still kept in contact with a lot of his friends. But there are some nights that I go to bed wondering, did I do all that I could on them six days a week to reach him? Did I live a testimony that was good enough before him? Most nights I come to the answer, no, Brother Brian. If you'd seen what I've seen, my, by the world's metric, he was successful. But he was chasing something that he couldn't find. Then I get to college fourth year her senior year of college girl that I was on the debate team with engaged to one of the guys on the debate team happy relationship she's got job offers lined up all over the place from law, law schools to Supreme Court justice uh, law clerks wanted this girl they found her dead one day in her apartment suicide no note nothing successful 4.0 GPA had everything that the world would say you need in order to be happy but she couldn't find it you look at the faces of people at gas stations both of them are either angry some of them are just hopeless you look at the people in the drive through most of them are stressed out and you can tell that all they're waiting to do is clock out and once they clock out, they'll probably tire themselves to death trying to find whatever it is that they're looking for, and they'll go to bed exhausted, wake up, and do it all over again. But see, I get in here, and I find out that, hey, I used to be one of them. And I know how much God loved me, so I know how much God loves them. And if you've seen what I've seen, you know how precious a soul is to God. I wish I could say those were the only two examples of people that I know, but there's more. 
there's more people that end it or have life ended too short because they can't find the thing that gives peace that passeth all understanding. They can't find the one who is altogether lovely. And if you've seen what I've seen, more people need to go and tell them. Not enough to try and live it. What did Jesus say he was going to do with the Apostle Paul in verse number 16? But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people <clears throat> and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God. Not just to go show, but to tell. To minister. To show forth the goodness of God to others. Not enough to be a written epistle. Sometimes books don't get read unless they hop off the shelf and get put in somebody's hand. How many times in school would you have read a book if a teacher didn't give you one and say, hey, you've got to read this? Yeah. Well, sometimes we need to be the book that jumps into somebody's hand and says, hey, let me tell you something. If you'd seen what I've seen, you'd know that Jesus wants to do for you what he's done for me. And it may not look like a lot, but I used to be in a dark place. But he took me from the mire and the muck of the world and he set me on a solid rock. And if you'd seen what he'd done for me, you'd know that he could do it for you too. If you'd seen what I've seen, you'd know that there are moments that God will give you that you can hold on to that nothing in this world could deter you. One of my favorite Sunday school messages that I ever got to preach was that one on three days and three nights. I got that on a Thursday night and slept three hours between then and Sunday because I just couldn't get over the thought of Jesus collecting the blood from Calvary just for me. That I couldn't get over the thought that the very Lord of heaven not only shed His blood but also said, no, i gotta, I got to get this because this is for Jordan. And not just was the blood to save Him but the blood to forgive Him of all the sins He'll commit after He gets saved. I couldn't, get, I couldn't sleep. I was just bawling my eyes out worshiping God. Why? Because it was something special to me. I've seen them verses that I can hold on to that jump off the page when you're reading them and God engraves them in the fleshy tables of your heart. And I've seen what just a word fitly spoken or fitly written in the Word of God can do for you to just hold on and go the extra mile. I've seen people that when you ask them, they say, how do you do it? Because he's just been so good. You could take everything. Heaven and earth can pass away, but his word won't pass away. Amen. If you've had them moments like I can't explain it. Right? Dad says he smelled him. He's heard him walk. I swear I've felt his hand on my back. Where'd that happen? Not with other people. In a private place. If you've seen them things that he does in private and then outwardly and openly he rewards that private time, you'd know that it doesn't matter what persecution comes as a result of this revival. Doesn't matter what the world throws at you. Doesn't matter how your flesh feels, how even maybe spiritually you feel. That if you just get one of them moments... That you can go back and say, hey, I remember that. You'll keep on keeping on. Because you realize how real it is to God that He wants you in His service. He wants you as a soldier for His cause. He wants you in the fight so badly that He'll spend time personally with you to equip you, to encourage you, to edify you so that you become more like Him. And when you realize how much you mean to God, it'll humble you. But it'll also encourage you to say, well, if God thinks I'm worth it, maybe I'm, I should think that I'm worth it. Finally, if you've seen what I've seen, you'd either get in or you'd get out. I've seen people that God come through and give the church a decision. You can get in or you can get out. 
And I've seen what happens when those that stay in aren't all the way in. I've seen a man that at one point held positions in the church. At one point would get up and teach Sunday school or preach. And I've seen him stub up on God and get in the way. And today he's got such a bad case of Alzheimer's and dementia, he doesn't even know who he is anymore. I've seen God move people out of the way. I've seen God chasing people back into the way. And being honest, I was one of them. I know what it is to have everything that you thought you wanted taken away from you. All of your ambitions, like that song that Dad will sing every now and then, the anchor holds. Right? I had visions, but they fell through my hands like grains of sand. They just passed away. You find out, like Solomon did, that vanity, vanity, all is vanity. It means emptiness. I've learned that lesson personally because sometimes I'm hard-headed and I don't get it unless I live it. But you, you, I was getting ready to say, but we're all that way. Right? I've seen that if you don't get in, the Lord's either going to make you get in or you're going to make yourself get out. Because if you've seen what I've seen, you want to get in because it gets you closer to the one that you love. If you've seen what I've seen, you realize, really, what is recreation time? What's the value? And watch it. I pay for the Netflix, the Disney Plus. Or no, I don't pay for the Disney Plus. But I pay for the Netflix and the Vudu that we use. I haven't even used it, Brother Brian, and I don't know how long. But every now and then, Addie comes over and wants to watch something, and then Taya has to ask me for the password so Addie can watch it. Well, Taya's babysitter. Right, things that used to... It's not because one day I made the decision, here, Lord, I'm going to give these things to you. It's just that the more I think about Him, the less I want to think about them things. I can't tell you the last time I watched the news, people ask me all the time, you hear about this? No. News is depressing or it makes me angry. I've got better things to do. Can't tell you the last time I watched a TV show. Used to, I like to watch all them superhero shows. As soon as they come out, if it was on Netflix, I'd watch all of them in like a Saturday. Just don't care that much anymore. Too many of them been bad. Right? Too many of them, because they put in a whole bunch of liberal ideology into it, it makes me angry. But you say, well, what is all that? No, that's just God being a consuming fire. You want to get closer to Him, some things are just going to not mean as much to you anymore. Some people think that in order to get closer to God, every time you've got to come and you've got to lay an Isaac down on the altar. No. If you just fall in love with Him, them things don't matter no more. You won't care about giving it up because something means more to you. Not a gambling man. I don't want to tempt God, but I'd put odds on some people. What's the over-under that they'd even come back tonight? And God's saying, you're either in or you're out. You either get hooked up with the train that the Lord's trying to do around here. Because I believe as much as He's been working and He's been showing out that He's going to say, if you don't get in, He'll get you out. That's a dangerous thing. I've seen what happens to people that tried to resist what the Lord was doing or tried to de detour the things that God was doing into something that they wanted to be done. I can promise you this, they're not in the building today. I can promise you this, they're not going to be in the building all week. Some of them are in the grave. Some of them have ruined their lives so much that they're ashamed to even enter a house of God because they know what they used to be for God. Not saying it should be that way, especially around here. They should know the people that love on them. But there are some that just can't get over what they used to be and how they ruined it. But some, you get in the way. If we don't get in line. God's liable to stamp Ichabod above the doors out there. 
You say, well, it can't happen. It happened around here before. It was a rough time here for a long time. Not because God didn't want to do something, but because people wouldn't get in line with what God wanted to do. Got to the point that some even questioned whether the door should be open at all. Thankfully, some stood up and said, nah, thank God's still going to do something around here. They just believed that God had put them there for a purpose. And they've gotten to see the fruit that God's given on that account time and time again and over and over again. But see, we could sit here and say, well, God's blessed. God's done all this for us. Yeah, but he wants to do more. Amen. And we don't like more because more makes us uncomfortable. We like the new pews with the lumbar support. Hey, I do too. We like that we come in and this week there weren't any offer. Hey, who wants to come in and help paint this week? Who wants to help work on the new building? Brother Ray, he'll tell you, thankfully, hadn't had to build a new stage in a while. But he was up in the attic over there on the other side of the building at 6 a.m. one day last week because he's crazy. But see, we don't like new. Don't know why. Every time God does something new, it's just better than what he did before. But that's the flesh fighting. That's the eternal conflict that every Christian has between the spirit and the flesh. But see, if you've seen what I've seen and the markers that I have to go back and look at and say, yeah, I don't want to do that. Because three things will happen if people get in the way. God will move you out of the way. God will move you into the way. Or the devil will move a wedge into the church. And if that wedge happens, we won't have a church family that's known for being the most loving. Or being the most compassionate. You know how many preachers have come through here that later have said that they was on their last leg and they was thinking about giving in? And because of how good God was to them through us, that it gave them wind to get back in with fire and zeal for God. You know how many people have come here that said, I didn't think I'd ever find a church that I'd want to go to again? You find the people that come in and say, my whole life I was taught something different, but now I get it. You know how many people have come in and been in bondage either by Satan or bondage by self or bondage by other people and God break those chains in this church? And you know how many more could come through those doors and have that happen? Well, last I counted, there's about 450,000 in northern Kentucky. Boone, Kenton, Campbell, Grant, Gallatin. That might be outdated because I think that was a 2012 census. Fields are wide and white under harvest. And it's high time that we awoke and said, Lord, I want to get in. Or Lord, I'm in, but steer me in the right direction because I want to get out of your way and just let you get in here and do something. Because it's not going to happen unless we're the church that's fitly framed together as he wants us to be. One body without division think we got a good church family now what do you think it would be like if God sends revival around here man I like some of y'all but you know every now and then I'm like hey I gotta go home maybe I'll get to the point that I want to spend more time with y'all than I do one that I want to spend by myself that'd be an act of God I like my alone time but you say brother Jordan what you, I've seen a I haven't been around in a long time, but I've seen a lot. Especially in churches. Why? Because I've been raised in one. It's where my whole life's been spent. I wouldn't trade it any other way. But I've seen a lot, and I know two things are true, Brother Brian. You can stand on everything in here. And regardless of what people do, God's always faithful and true. 
You can take both of them to the bank. And once you get there, you'll be able to cash that check. It's not going to bounce. Let me, I was listening this, this morning to that song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Third verse says, you know, His word He has promised will not fail you. Believe Him and all will be well. Don't I mean, get a good look at Him and then get your nose in the book. And yeah, there might be storms, there might be hard times, but He'll give you everything you need to not only get through it, but to get over it. Because some people are bought through things and they never get over it. They never get past it. In their minds, they're still living back where they used to be and they're ignoring everything that's going on right here in front of them. But some people have just learned that... Anybody else guilty of not cleaning their glasses like they should? Yeah. Anybody else ever take them off and realize, man, these things are pretty dirty. How come I didn't notice that? Because you can get to the point where you just look past all the flaws that are right in front of you and you can see out beyond them. God will allow you to see things that are out a little bit. How do you do that? The light of the Word. The lamp that's under your feet. You get to focus in on what God wants you to look at. All them things that used to be. All them things that you're not satisfied with about yourself. All those things that you did that you wish you could take back. You can see right past them. And you can see what God wants you to be in Him. You say that's hard. Yeah. But you get a good look at Jesus. The Apostle Paul said it is brighter than the sun. He's saying nothing else. I couldn't see anything but what God wanted me to see. And afterwards, he, was so, he got such a good look, he was blinded for a little bit. That's right. You get a good enough look at Jesus, the only thing that you're going to remember seeing is Jesus. And Jesus just might prevent you from seeing anything else but Jesus. But when we pursue it after we get the choice, or do I go back, try and get back into that light again? Or do I go forward and just go through the motions? Do I sit there content in what God's given me and lose all ambition to strive for the cause of Christ? Or do I remember those things that I've seen and use them as the fuel, as the motivation I need to go an extra day? It's one more mile. Go back to the well that I know isn't going to run dry on me because he's the one that put it in my soul. Yeah, it takes work. No, it's not easy. Yeah, everybody in your life may be trying to pull you out of what God's trying to do. But if you purpose to do it, God will help you do it. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.